Good morning and welcome to All Saints Episcopal Church. My name is Sally Howard and my pronouns are she, her. We are so grateful that we can be together as a congregation in the forum this morning, despite many obstacles. And as our rector Mike Kinman says, although our buildings are closed, our church is open. We have a saying here at All Saints, whoever you are and wherever you are in your journey, you are welcome to this community of love, peace, and justice. These words of radical welcome have been a part of the DNA of All Saints Church for decades. We believe we are called to offer broadly inclusive message of hope and healing to all those seeking to find and be found by God. And we recognize the need to offer an explicit invitation to members of the LBGTQ community who have too often been rejected by the church because of who they are and who they love. It is National Coming Out Day, and we are observing it with a stellar interfaith panel of queer leaders reflecting on the coming out process in their faith traditions. And now it's my joy to introduce Thomas Diaz, the leader of our LBGTQ ministry here at All Saints Church. Thomas? Awesome. Thank you so much, Sally. Good morning, All Saints. Um, happy National Coming Out Day. Um, I'm one of the co-leaders of the LGBTQ ministry here at All Saints, and I'm also on the vestry. Uh, welcome to the special Rector's Forum on National Coming Out Day. Uh, this morning, we have a, a forum titled Queer Faith, uh, the struggle for the full embrace of LGBTQ persons in Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. So a little history of National Coming Out Day. Every year on this day, we celebrate the coming out as lesbians, gay, bisexual, transgender, or queer. This year will mark the 32nd anniversary of this day. National Coming Out Day began during the National March on Washington for lesbian and gay rights 32 years ago. It was observed as a day to remember that, the, that one of our basic tools is the power of coming out. One of every two Americans has someone close to them who is LGBTQ. Coming out still matters. It still matters even in 2020. When people, when people know someone who is LGBTQ, they get a better understanding of that struggle of coming out and hold that capacity to share that story and provide solidarity. This morning, we will dive and discuss not just about LGBTQ identity, but also a faith identity that often is layered with more challenges. Uh, with me this morning are three outstanding individuals uh, who know a little something about the struggle uh, for full embracing of LGBTQ uh, faith in the community. And um, I would like to now introduce the panel. Uh, we have Rabbi Miller. So Rabbi, would you please introduce yourself to us? Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me. I'm Rabbi Heather Miller. Uh, I am. I live down in Orange County, but I'm a good friend of All Saints Church in Pasadena. Really, thank you so much for having me here. I founded something called Keeping It Sacred, which is an online community of people looking into the text and thinking about what, how we keep our lives sacred in an accessible, relevant, and empowering way. Um, I did serve in the past. I served the BCC, Beth Chaim Chadashim, which is the world's first LGBT founded Jewish congregation. And uh, I'm really happy to be here as well. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Rabbi Miller. And we also have our very own Kelly Aaron, who is with us. Kelly, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Kelly Aaron O'Fallon. Um, my pronouns are they, them. I'm the children's minister at All Saints Church in Pasadena. Here. Awesome. Um, we had advertised before that Blair Amani was supposed to join us, um, and she's unable to be with us this morning. Um, but just um, so we can give a little introduction who uh, Blair was. Uh, Blair identifies as a Black, bisexual, Muslim. Uh, Blair is a historian, an uh, educator, and an author of two books, um, Modern History, Stories of Women and Non-Binary People, and Making Our Way Home, The Great Migration, 
Black American Dream. And you can find those books obviously at your local bookstore. And you can follow Blair uh, at uh, Blair's uh, Instagram at Blair Armani. So uh, you can do that as well. So, and Blair, if you're watching, we're so sorry you can't be with us this morning, but uh, we hope to continue to be in dialogue uh, in the future. Uh, so this morning, um, we're gonna go ahead uh, and get started with a slate of topics that we have. But first, uh, to the audience, if you have any questions uh, during this forum, you can use the uh, Q&A uh, feature on here on Zoom. It's in the bottom of your screen. Uh, if you can't locate that, you can type in your questions in the chat box and we'll get to them at the end of our presentation. So to really the three of us here, um, I'll, you know, we've had some questions that I'm gonna kind of pose to all of us. Um, I'll kind of fill in since Blair's not here, um, but um, let's, let's kind of go ahead and get started with that on this form. And so the, the first question we have is what intrigues you about the subject of queer faith? Um, and what do you think the people of Olsen Church need to hear from you? Um, and Kelly, would you like to start off? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think the thing that intrigues me the most about queer faith is uh, all the possibilities and the excitement that comes with um, being just the extra layer in the LGBTQ community, um, having that extra piece of identity. I know personally, I've been a lifelong Episcopalian and I've made um, a lot of my closest friends in the Episcopal church with other queer people who I met through church. Um, so I think that queer faith just at a baseline provides an incredible layer of community, which is so important, especially for LGBTQ people, especially for LGBTQ young people. Um, and I think that the, just like our sacred texts have so much to say about liberation and what that does for all of us. Um, I think it is really, it's just an incredible thing to be um, a Christian and an LGBTQ person. Thank you, Kelly Aaron. Rabbi Miller, how would you respond to that? Yeah, I, I love it. Um, I'm gonna take an interesting, so my wife, uh, my wife went to business school and we went to a business school conference for the LGBT community. There was like all of the students who were part of uh, affinity groups for the LGBT community went. And we had a speaker who wrote a book called The Q Quotient, which is all about what happens when people in business come out. Okay, so what happens when people in business come out, right? You think that there, it's business, there's no place for sexual orientation here. But what happened, the, the book says is that every time someone came out at work, everyone else around them felt like they could be more of who they are at work. Right, so the person who loves camping could share more about camping and how much they love camping. The person who loves spiders could share more about how much they love spiders. Everyone around them felt like they could bring more of their full selves to the workplace environment. And if the business school community can get that, <laughs> then I think all the more so in a church community, in a synagogue community, in a mosque community, in, in a spiritual community, every time each of us unlocks the light that's within us to share more of who we are, the community is stronger for it. So what excites me is that, you know, in all of those places, as a rabbi, I'm really interested in helping people feel comfortable being more of who they are in all that they are. That's what we used to say at BCC, we would bless our children. May you be who you are in all that you are, because that's the beautiful thing. And we can really build community when we're all most of who we are. Yes, absolutely. And what comes to mind with that, Robbie Miller, is when I've been thinking about queer faith, you know, the way I, I kind of see it is that it actually does, it's a healing property to bring uh, for folks who have been rejected for the notion that your mosque your temple or your church rejects you for who you are um the very notion that god rejects you um which is formal is you right and that's the queer faith that says you know that really dismantles that idea and yet the struggle to get there i as you said robbie miller i think that it would it takes one person to actually go through that experience and, and reclaim like that who i am and what I am as identity is, is beloved. And 
that has that ripple effect. And I, I think that was a great example that you had with the business uh, industry. Um, yeah, and can we get, you know, our church, our mosque and our temple to do the same? You know, that would, uh, hopefully we're doing that today, uh, this morning and doing that. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> we'll go ahead and um, go to the second uh, kind of question. Um, so, you know, what pieces of the past, the present and the future most inspire us here um, or enrage, still enrage us or drives us to despair as a person of current identity and faith? Um, you know, and that's a lot, I think, in contain to say that, you know, we probably could spend some time of time dissecting each one, but, you know, I can start off with this one and, and say that for me, my most recent, uh, I guess, form of hope that I had uh, was that around actually this time last year um, when I was out at the, in DC at the Supreme Court for the uh, oral hearings of uh, the cases that were taken up for LGBTQ discrimination uh, in the workplace, uh, more specifically for the trans community. And I remember being in the front steps, you know, of the Supreme Court. And, you know, we had many organizations were out there. It was the day of that particular hearing. And for me, it dawned on me for the first time um, of how much stridement we have come as a community and still come, but it, the idea that we came out in, in force and with loudness and boldness and posters and, and really saying that we're gonna claim our hope. You know, we can have the powers that are among us and, and think that they're gonna you know, detect us. And we have, I, unfortunately, I think we have that coming up soon again. Um, but but the, the very fact that as the community, we, we know our despair, we know what the past is but when, when the challenge is, is, is met for us, we will come with our voice. And I think it's the voices that I, that I heard um, in that moment was like, that is the hope um, that I have. Um, you know, and, and, and layered it with faith, it was amazing to see how many folks uh, of rabbis um, and pastors there uh, who were offering prayer and spiritual support. It was just the most amazing thing to see. And I think often, you know, the rest of our nation doesn't know that, right? And that, that's the visibility that still needs to happen with that. Um, we can go, you know, Rabbi Miller, how would you respond to that question? That's, that's so good. I love that. I mean, yeah, I mean, what was that last week? The, the weeks are melding together because of coronavirus. But I think it was last week that uh, Justice Alito and Justice Thomas were talking about rolling back marriage equality. And um, I, I married and I benefited from that. I actually got married three times. Uh, I got a first domestic marriage partnership. And then uh, when it was going to be legal and then it wasn't legal again, we instead had a spiritual wedding uh, because it wasn't yet legal. And then because uh, we didn't want to have a shotgun wedding when it was legal, because then uh, my wife's family from the Philippines would not be able to come over in time. So we, we, we had hope for California, but Prop 8 passed and we were not allowed to get married. So we had a spiritual wedding in 2012. And then the day that it became legal for us, we uh, had a legal marriage ceremony in West Hollywood Park. And um, it was a, a fabulous ceremony and uh, opportunity to celebrate our love. So the, the, we had hoped that we would be the last generation of queer folk to have to have multiple wedding celebrations, but um, that's not the case. So I think that it is terrifying to think about not just marriage either. I mean, that's just what directly impacts me right now. I have a family with two kids. Um, and I adopted one of them and my wife adopted the other one because we each had one. So there could be many, many implications for us in our family life, which is terrifying, absolutely terrifying to think about our family being ripped apart. Um, so that's that's definitely there, of course, you know, uh, trans violence of people of color, uh, all of it. There's there's so much that we could talk about um, discrimination in the workplace, uh, housing, all kinds of issues. Um, but 
as far as you know that hope that you mentioned thomas i love that that idea of that we're all coalescing you know well before marriage equality you know we had the the lgbt pride parade in los angeles and every morning right before we step out to march in that pride parade we would have an interfaith uh celebration and remembrance for those who died as well but also a, a service there was an interfaith service and we'd always have you know we'd always start off we'd step off on the right foot to to march in a way that was centered in our spirituality and our faith so we have always been coalescing but i i'm very propelled and hopeful about the kinds of coalescing that is continuing to to build momentum and build movement and then as far as the past goes you know we stand on the shoulders of giants in our day our ability to come out things are different from when i even i was a youngster and i'm 41 right so things you know the ability for people to actively claim our gender identity and the fact that we are still working out the language for that what does it mean to be queer what you know can we even claim that word now is that still offensive or not right all of those questions i think that space of that creative space right now i have a friend whose husband works on um, making sure that the hebrew language is gender inclusive because it is gendered a gendered language so thinking about all of this creative energy to kind of more aptly describe our human experience that is so exciting and standing on the shoulders of giants who didn't have that language yet available to them and who really were just trying to say, we're here, we're queer, get used to it. It's like even just yeah. able to claim sacred space and just say, no, we are created also in the image of God. We are all here and to make room for us as well, that we're, we're so lucky to have, to have the, the benefit of the shoulders of, of those who came before. And I hope that we do right by the generations to come that we make room for them and, and explore the language that uh, will help them describe their experiences more accurately. Absolutely. Thank you, Rabbi, Thank you for that. Yeah. Kelly, Kelly Aaron. Yeah. Oh, I, when I think about like inspirational things that have happened in the past, um, I think about what All Saints did during that time when marriage equality was like, eh, eh, and how many folks um, All Saints work to get married and just like the boom, boom, weddings, 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 and what an incredible pastoral thing. Um, just that is just something that the church, it was meeting the need at the moment. And that gives me so much hope and excitement. Um, especially since it was like, we'll break all our rules on doing outside weddings. Everyone gets a wedding. And it was just such, you know, and many of you I'm sure were there for that <laughs> at All Saints. I was in, um, I was in middle school um, during Pop Position 8. <laughs> and um, I just, I do still remember like seeing um, pictures because I was an Episcopalian as a kid and uh, seeing pictures from All Saints and what they were doing and the the Prop 8 signs around All Saints. And I just found it so like inspirational and exciting that a church would do something so like controversial and so in the moment and just really filling a need. Um, so I hope my biggest hope for the future is we find ways and opportunities to do that. Um, even when things are really scary, even when, you know, there's budget shortfalls, we're still able to really radically meet the needs of the most marginalized. Um, like lots of churches will say they welcome LGBTQ people, but they don't actually mean the end. <laughs> they don't welcome trans people. They don't welcome non-binary people. Um, I'm non-binary. I use they, them pronouns and my spouse is trans and um, just so many churches don't even have the architectural setup to be actually inclusive. Um, they have gendered bathrooms, they have um, gendered spaces, they have, you know, women's voices, men's voices. They have just so, so much excessively gendered things. Um, and when you gender a space, I think it's really important to think about why. Like, if you have a women's group, why do you have a women's group? Like, what do you mean by that? What is, um, do you, do you, when you say, if you say that non-binary folks are welcome, do you just mean you welcome them because you think of them as women? Like what is, do you actually mean like non-men, all non-men are welcome here? Um, so it's really, 
really interesting. And I, I see where the truth can go with that if we choose to act bravely and um, boldly in the future. So I, I do get inspired about when um, All Saints does things like provide, you know, 100 binders for LGBTQ youth, um, mostly queer youth of color in Los Angeles um, who need a chest binder to flatten their chest to make them feel affirmed and good in their gender. Um, that's something All Saints did last year when we have done makeup drives. I think that is really incredible action and step. And there's just so many things, especially in the last four years to give to when folks choose to give to a cause so many think is over or done. Um, it's really, really incredible because we're so, so far from the fight being over. It's just, uh, and even thinking about like what, what does the like reversal of marriage equality mean for me? It's like, can my spouse not get a legal name change and gender change soon? Do we, you know, need to grab that $500 out of savings now and just do it. And it's just, it's can be scary and being trans is expensive. <laughs> it's very expensive to change your name and your legal or uh, and your gender pronoun um, on your ID. And um, yeah, it's just, it's scary on top of an already really scary time. So I have a lot of anxiety around that. And I do pull a lot of inspiration from um, what has happened in the past. And I know that a lot of other churches are like nowhere not to be like, oh, all saints, yes. But so many, I have a colleague group of queer um, ministers who work at other large Episcopal churches around the country around all saints' size and some smaller. And they can't even, like no one can use a they, them pronoun in the congregation or staff. And I feel pretty good that we are getting closer every year. And um, I have a lot of hope and excitement that we can keep working and going on that. Cause I know we can absolutely get there. We just gotta put in the work. Um, and it's hard, especially when there's so much going on but when you put in the work you unlock so much for yourself. Like it's not just about um, it's not just about like doing the right thing or being a good ally. ally. Like I know this because when I show up for um, Black Lives Matter, like I get fed so much out of that and I have a personal stake in that liberation. I need um, cis head people to have a personal stake in my liberation too. And what that will do for them will just open, I think what Rabbi Miller said about, you know, it opens everyone to be more themselves. It absolutely will. Um, and it opens up a better world. And that is exciting for people of all genders and sexualities. I think you're so right. Can I just jump right in here? Um, I, you know, there's, I really want to share so much about what you just said, but one of the things about putting in the work, it's so important to put in the work, you know, um, in one of the congregations I served, someone boldly came out and shared what their gender pronouns were. And uh, one of our members said, well, I'm not going to call you that because you're a woman, you're not, you're not a, a man. And I just like, as the rabbi, I looked at the person and said, I called the person by their name. Hey, person, like, you can do better than that. <laughs> like, you can, like, we all can do better than what we have set as a bar for ourselves. We can each challenge ourselves. Yeah, maybe the gender pronouns are going to be clumsy at first, but you can do better. You can do it because we we didn't used to call women anything other than misses if they were married before and we changed it to miss and we you know we're starting to we've always understood gender in lots and lots of different ways and i think that this is just we have to think about what values there are what do we have to gain like what you said kelly about what are we gaining for our entire community when everyone is shown the respect that they that is like god given respect of like integrity and dignity of being simply being called what you want to be called and not being called a different name. Um, so I think that that's, that's so important that we each take the responsibility to do the work and wherever someone, you know, throws up their hands says, I don't get this, these, all these genders. And so, no, like, 
okay, well then learn about them. <laughs> like, you know, okay, then, you know, let's, let's do this together. We can do this. Like we are a church that is centered on, you know, the sanctity of all life and the sanctity of every human being who walks in that door. And we have been hurt by the church and we know what it feels like to be hurt by the church. And this is going to be our church of healing, a place of healing. Right. And I say that for synagogues and mosques and everywhere, right. What kind of a, an institution do you want to be? What kind of community do you want to be? And how do you reflect that in your language and all the, all that you do? And the other thing I wanted to share was another thing that gives me a lot of hope is this thing. It says Queer and Teen Camp 2020. There was an online interfaith camp, international interfaith camp um, this summer. And I got to speak at it. And they have like this great, there's even like a we're here, we're queer, we're filled with brim and cheer. Like it's, it was such an affirming space, right? See, Kelly's like, yes, it goes straight to your heart, right? It makes you feel so good to know, right? Susan writes, oh my God, who knew? Right, who knew? This is such a great, inspiring opportunity for people to um, create the space for us all to be ourselves. And really, when you join a space like that, you see how how beneficial it is to everyone involved to just feel feel so excited. You know, and this is from a synagogue that is just, you know, it's not a queer synagogue, but they this was their their pin that they wore at the Pride Parade in San Diego last year, Works Lake Vetch. You know, there people, other organizations are opening up funders, thank you, funders, you're funding all of this work to make sure that people can, that we can take religious life to the next level and to really open it up and, and uh, allow everyone to shine our lights. And Kelly, you talk about redemption. It's absolutely a redemptive opportunity. In the in rabbinic texts, we talk about um, the day that Joseph was brought up out of jail was the same day conflated into the same day that the Israelites went down to Egypt to escape famine, to be redeemed from the famine, which was also conflated to be the same day that the exodus took place, that the Israelites were left out of oppression. So when we unlock ourselves from the jails of, you know, everyone else's perception, when we free ourselves from worrying about where our sustenance comes from, to we have basic dignity rights, and then when we go out into our own freedom and liberate ourselves, singing the song at the sea into our own freedom, that is when light is unlocked. And it says that those nights are like day and the daylight, the sun shines seven times as bright as it, as it is on a normal day. So that is that kind of light filled redemptive situation that we are all trying to build. And, and, and this panel is uh, an inspiration to me as well. Thank you so much, Rabbi. And if I can yeah, go ahead. jump, I just, uh, Rabbi Miller, I love what you said about the people who throw up their hands and they're like, pronouns, I can't even do them. Um, that's just one of my favorite responses. And it's just like, how dramatic, like, how dare you call the queer community dramatic in this moment when like, oh my goodness, just diva down, you can do it. Like, it's not hard. There are books on this subject. There are places online you can practice. You can practice in your home and your family. Um, you can practice like calling your dog by a different pronouns, like how silly and ridiculous, but also like if that's what it takes for you to unlock this um, so you don't make mistakes in front of um, people who are trans, um, just do it. Like put in the work, it's gonna be worth it. And you're gonna be a more enlightened, like smart, brilliant, responsive person. Did we just quote uh, Taylor Swift? <laughs> you need to calm down. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Absolutely. That's great. Oh, thank you. Thank you uh, to the both of you. We're getting a lot of amens in the chat. So let's kind of keep this uh, momentum going here. Um, so our, our, for our third question, you know, in your tradition, um, what in scripture gives you solace? And how do you see scripture being used in several ways against you or against us as a community? And Rabbi Miller, would you like to? Sure, I mean, there, I, I have so much to say on this, but um, I'll, I'll just give a couple. So obviously Leviticus 18.22, man should not lay with another man as he does a woman, is used against us all the time. I just wanna point out it's men, not women. So let's just get lesbians out of there. <laughs> And all non-men, <laughs> like, okay. So 
The word that's used for it is toiva in Hebrew, toiva, which means abomination. But the word abomination is used for all kinds of other things. And it's really meant in the in the Bible um, to be a statement against Greek culture. And so it was much more, if you if you look up the word toiva, anyone who's a biblical scholar, here's a Bible challenge. Look up toiva, to T-O-E-V-A-H, you can, that's the way that it's spelled in uh, transliteration, you can do this online. But um, if you look that up, you'll see that um, all the different things that are, are told that is an abomination have to do with not being like other people, not being like the Greek specifically. Um, so that's, I think it's such a misuse of the understanding I think also, you know, when people cherry pick from the Bible and say like the Tor the Bible or the Torah says this or that, the Torah says a lot of things. It says to, you know, stone your child if they swear against you, right? None of us are would propose to do that. Um, so we're, we all have to think about what aspects of the Torah or of the, the Bible really do speak to us and what kind of what do we want to kind of help us navigate our own lives? Um, I'm really inspired by when the Torah, anything in the in the act of creation here, Andy Wells mentions a bunch more about toy is also about eating shellfish, pork, remarrying your first wife after her second spouse dies, right? There's so many things that toy va. So um, in, in, the, in the apologetic Jewish parts of the community, they say like, look, don't hate gay people more than you hate people who eat pork. So, okay, if that's what helps you, great. But um, it's, uh, so so that's all, that's, that's with that. That's the hardest thing. Um, as far as, you know, there's, there's a lot in the Talmud actually about women uh, relationships and how they're actually non-events. It, it's kind of interesting there. Um, but uh, as far as gender goes, there's six genders mentioned in the Mishnah. So we think about like how, oh, well, this is such a new thing. It was always men and women, men and women, men and women. And now it's like, who are these people who are coming in to change what gender is? No, 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 no. In the year 200, when the Mishnah was codified, and it was just codified then, which means that the language, the teachings were earlier than that. Um, there was six understanding, six categories of gender, one of them included the tum tum, which is someone who's uh, like transgender. Um, there's one called androgynous. Guess what that is? Androgynous. <laughs> um, so you know, it, it's not a new thing. And what's interesting is the way that the rabbis handled those six genders was that they slotted those six genders into the two genders so that they could make in their own worldview, make the genders work. They said that all five of these, we're gonna treat them as female and all then this one we're gonna treat as male and that's how we're gonna relate to people, which is, which is one way to approach it. But another way is to actually just more fully um, accept and welcome and treat everyone as the individuals that they are um, understanding these six genders and more um, and, and broadening out that spectrum. So that's interesting. And then one other is, is all of the pairs of people in the Bible. We, we In the Jewish community, in the queer Jewish community, a lot of us look to uh, Ruth and Naomi. We look to... Um, to some of the rabbis, Jonathan and Rachel Lakish, Rabbi Yochanan and, and Rachel Lakish. If you look up some of these stories, you'll see that they're, that if you look a little closer, you can see there's some elements of uh, some queerness going on. And um, so I think that it's not a case of it was never there and now it is. It's more of a case of it was always there. We're just seeing it now and uh, bringing it to light. And again, with the light theme of redeeming, redeeming these stories for ourselves. So that's exciting. Absolutely, that light, absolutely, yes. Uh, Kelly Aaron, how would you like to respond to that question? Oh, the rabbi said it so well, I have very little to add, but um, yeah, I think that when we look at scripture, there's just the overarching theme of what, you know, when I think about the Bible, as I think of about a story of redemption and a story of compassion and liberation um, and what that, what that means for all of us, I think it's really exciting, you know, what, what Moses did, you know, you think of, you know, how many times in the Bible, you know, 
I think of the veggie tales and the wall and, you know, just, it's just over and over and over again. Um, there's a theme of kind of a, a person who is not seen as, you know, great or big or important does something incredible. Um, really, really, you know, topples a government, a leadership, you know, Jesus's life was about tearing down um, what, you know, the whole system, what happens when you, you know, literally flip the tables, what happens when you um, tell the least of these, they're the most important. It's so much goodness. And uh, Susan put a great link just now in about more in those texts. And of course, there are the clobber passages. Um, I grew up in Missouri in the buckle of the Bible belt. And um, what was said about LGBTQ people growing up was really intense. And um, I just think it's, it's so interesting how people cling to that and don't think about how, you know, what, like there weren't words for loving consensual LGBTQ relationships, you know, a hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, 2000 years ago. Um, so I think, yeah, people just, they're very silly when it comes to picking out things out of the Bible that they've just got to grab onto when there's so much of an overarching theme of justice and compassion and liberation. Um, why would you not cling to that? Why would you cling on to the hate? It, I don't know. I don't get it. It seems very silly. And like I grew up in an affirming church my whole life. I had a gay priest in high school who was super great and life-changing. And like that is what's kind of in store, I think, for future generations when we do the work now is we don't pass on this generational trauma of religious persecution. So like that gets me all jazzed up. I want to share a little bit more about the about the the couples too, the idea about what does it make, you know, it's like it's a you know God made a woman for Adam, like Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve people, right? So if we look at if we look at Genesis 2, 18, right, it says the Lord God said, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make a fitting helper for him. So first of all, man is not man. It's Adam. Adam means the human, right? Because this is when Adam was created in the image of God, male and female, God created them. So God was cre Adam was created, we could say also as androgynous, okay, as intersex, we could say. Um, uh, so it's not good for the androgynous being to be alone, I will make a fitting helper for him. So for him, again, that's where the gender comes in as far as the adjective, but the word fitting helper is actually ezer kenegdo. Ezer means helper. Ke means as if. Negdo means opposite. So the fitting helper for this intersexed Adam creature. So it's not at all about um, making a woman for a man. It's about not having this creature being alone and to create a fitting helper, someone that's opposite, but a helper. And what is an opposite helper? It's someone who is different enough from you that challenges you to continue to grow, but they're ultimately, they're your helper. They're your foundational support. They're there because they're challenging you, L'Shem Shemaim, for the sake of heaven, not for the sake of tearing you down, but really for the sake of building you up. And when I think about love like I just actually officiated a wedding yesterday in Joshua Tree and it happened to be a straight wedding but um you know when I think about love and I officiate all of these weddings that I do it's it's not about you know I now pronounce you man and wife it's not about that at all it's about that you are not going to be alone here and you are you have found your fitting helper for yourself, someone who's challenging for you, but also ultimately at the end of the day, just has so much love and respect and, and pride for you. So it, it's important to, to not, um, to challenge people on that, because if you just look in the Hebrew, just look in the Hebrew, it's there. It's just been translated so poorly. Yeah, absolutely, yes. Um, this is wonderful. Uh, just to remind uh, the audience um, that we will have a Q&A in, in about five minutes. So you can use the Q&A function on Zoom and we'll get to some of those questions. But we do have one more a question to reflect on as a group before we get there. Um, and which, you know, as I'm looking at it, I think we've kind of already, you know, touched on it and spoken it, but, you know, we kind of want to maybe in a way just end it on, on this note. And, and that is, you know, 
what hope do you have for people of queer identity and faith? And I know we've been speaking on it we're pretty much plainly on this, but if, you know, how would you sum up your hope from, from, from this mark onward? And we can start, uh, Kelly Aaron, would you like to uh, reflect on that? Yeah. Sure, yeah. I think I touched on it a little bit earlier, but I have a lot of hope in the future of uh, young people and kids and just how they wrote. I'll do a little plug for Children's Chapel today for National Coming Out Day. We're going to revisit like my favorite kids book. It feels good to be yourself. And it's about different gender identities and what happens, um, how great it feels to just be who you are and yourself, whatever that is. Um, which I think is great. <laughs> um, but I just have a lot of hope for how kids get it. Um, when uh, like so many of our kids, um, not just at All Saints, but kids in general are so able to grasp concepts that we just so have pinned down in our brain about gender and about sexuality and just kids get it in a exciting way and it unlocks so much for them um, when they can feel free to be themselves from a really young age that gives me a lot of hope especially when they're able to do that in a faith community you know when maybe that's not a norm at school but in faith communities we can set a norm and an expectation um, that kids are free to be themselves and how much like what does that do for our whole congregation if there is you know a kid in a sparkly tutu with nail polish who you may not think is a girl but is on their own gender journey, living their best life, dancing around the altar. What does that unlock for you as an adult? Like for me, it goes, oh, wow, I can make mistakes. Um, dancing up at the altar, I can break the rules. And, you know, uh, traditional like, oh, we'd never do that. But we get to see it with kids around the altar and with gender expression. It goes, wow, I can dress in a way that makes me feel really good at church too. I can wear whatever I want. I love it when kids wear like costumes or like crazy dress up outfits to church um, because it reminds us that like, oh, you do you, boo. It's just... Uh, I love it. And I get a lot of inspiration from um, the next, seeing the next generation of young leaguers. Amen. Amen to that. Like definitely the next generation, like I mentioned, like quarantine camp and all of that. Um, since we're doing a little book, book share and tell, I'll also share a book. <laughs> uh, oh, go on the, the other, so the other end. So yes, all of our youth and, and the spaces that we're creating, but also institutionally, I think major, major institutions are starting to really, really affirm uh, the queer community. And the reform movement of Judaism has been accepting LGBT Jews since 1983, and um, well, specifically transgender in 2008 when, or 2003, they uh, admitted the first openly uh, trans rabbinic school candidate, um, who is a friend. Um, and so uh, there's so many institutions that are really starting to open up. And the CCAR, the Central Conference of American Rabbis, actually just came out with this book called Where Pride Dwells. It's a celebration of LGBTQ Jewish life and ritual. It's edited by Rabbi Denise Egger and all of those of us in the LA area can say woo woo. That's someone who's an LA rabbi um, of Kol Ami, a synagogue. It's the, another Jewish queer synagogue in LA. Um, so there's one in uh, Beth Chaim Hadashim was the first and then uh, Kol Ami is the second. Um, in, in the LA area, there's others around the country. But um, so this is, is a real uh, collection. I actually have a page in it, it's page 133. It's the blessing that I always offer at that pride parade that I mentioned to you earlier um, when we step off. It's a remembering from where we come, or pausing for moments of memory for those who came before us. Um, the ones who personally stood up and were counted and who thus made a difference for all of us today. And it goes on. Um, there's, there's readings in here. There's poetry. There are um, understandings of the text. There's different blessings. Um, all kinds of uh, amazing, amazing material all together. And I think, you know, all of this creativity has been happening. But what's really exciting is that these major institutions are starting to, you know, back, you know, put the money behind it and back these books and back um, the programming and back, you know, the policies and boards, you know, 
kudos to all of anyone who's a board member of any institution that is really looking at your own policies and looking how to update, you know, the way that you interact with gender or sexuality. Kudos to you. I mean, that is so exciting because institutionally, that's we need to make institutional change can make major, major changes for so many. So that's that's what I'll share is and another exciting piece, aside from all the kids and all that amazingness, which is Absolutely. much fun. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Well, we have some really good questions. So I would like to get to that next. Uh, thank you for those who submitted. Uh, a, a, my a first question um, comes from a vestry member, uh, Art McDormick. Um, and Art uh, states this, and you, you two can respond however you feel. Uh, so the question is for thus, uh, for those of us who come out of the surging uh, San Francisco um, um, supervisor, uh, Marbley Milk in the 70s, organize our community to advance our civil rights and respond to the AIDS crisis. How specifically can we support our queer leaders in our spiritual communities today, besides stepping back and letting you lead the way into the 21st century. I love it. You know, I think um, if, if, unless Kelly, do you want to start? Okay. So um, first, thank you for your solidarity and thank you for your struggle. I mean, that, that we could not be here in the way that we are. We cannot show up the way that we are. So thank you for showing up then and thank you for showing up now because it's it's critical in the ways that I mentioned you know checking other people just encouraging other people in a loving way being the opposite helper for other people and just saying hey you can do better than that hey let's learn this together that that goes so far that is it's it's so helpful um I think not only for the the Harvey Milk um 70s era you know queer community or gay community at the time gay and lesbian community fighting AIDS but also um, in terms of feminists and second wave feminism, where the feminists have tried to get women to have women's spaces um, that were safe spaces. I think those of us in women's communities also um, can do a lot by just understanding and thinking more and researching more about what does it mean to be in a women's organization and what does it mean to uh, understand gender and understand the layers of gender and understand the power behind certain genders and the unpower <laughs> behind others. Um, I think all of us can uh, do well because I think, you know, you mentioned earlier like women's groups at church. We also in the Jewish community have sisterhood. We have the women of reform Judaism institutions, again, major institutions that are really grappling with these, with these questions. And the more that we can um, challenge ourselves to think about what did it mean to show up then? What does it mean to show up now? What does, where is the power and who are the ones being, um, having the power taken away and how can we, we join together in that, uh, in that struggle now? I think I, I really appreciate the question and it's just the continuation of thinking about how we can keep these sacred spaces open. I went to Wellesley College and Wellesley College is a women's college. And um, Wellesley College uh, went through our own um, grappling with these questions about gender. What does it mean for a women's college, one of the seven sisters schools, what does it mean for a women's college to now um, think about, you know, we're having people who, uh, who identify as trans. Do we accept trans people who are, who are women now, um, who, who, I mean, identify as women? Uh, who were not born uh, uh, with uh, genitalia that matched, right? So non-cis women. So uh, how do we understand welcoming in people who identify as non-binary? There was a real grappling about five, six years ago. And I think that we're better for it. And I think that there's so many other women spaces, space organizations that are doing that as well. So same thing with the queer community. I mean, just thinking a little bit more and thinking about what did it mean to show up then? How can we show up now? It's a, it's a great question. And we'll just keep, keep, keep that central theme, which is sharing the light and encouraging everyone to share the light. Always ask that question. What does it mean? How can I better help people share the light that they, that they have inside? And uh, that will lead the way. Absolutely. Um, I think one um, thing that folks who 
have done incredible, amazing work that definitely um, supported me into who I am today. Uh, and I'm so grateful for the incredible work that happened in the decades before I was born. Um, and so thankful for that work. I think one thing that folks can do is to really practice being, knowing when to call people in versus when to call people out. Um, <laughs> it's so easy to be like, you know, if you voted for this candidate, I never want to see you again. If you did this, I, you know, if you don't support Black Lives Matter as a white person, you know, unfriend me. I da da da. It's so easy to make these vast call out statements, um, which is like fair and comes from a point of exhaustion. But if you're in a non marginalized place and you're able to call someone in instead, um, it's an incredible gift to be like, Hey, you know, I know that when you see like um, pronouns besides she and he, you throw your hands up and you get freaked out and I get it, I've been there, but I would love for you to maybe read this book with me or I'm happy to talk with you about it. And if you're in a space where you have the energy and ability and you're in a non-marginalized position in that area, um, it's an incredible opportunity to call people into the work to be like, hey, you know, I know you're there now. Um, I want to help get you to where we should be in 2020. Like you've been an incredible advocate in the past. I would love to help you on your journey to continue to be an incredible advocate in 2020 and beyond. So, um, yeah. And I know a lot of like um, folks struggle with language and it's really, it's hard to find one consistent guide. Um, the podcast Gender Reveal has really good 101s and you can listen to them in the car, like Gender 101 goes over, um, you know, terms and definitions and it has really good updated information and like we'll go over more like nuanced things. Like when you put words like identifying in front of it, like, oh, this person identifies as non-binary. You should just say this person is non-binary because identifying is just like, oh, well, that's how they identify. But we all know Kelly's a girl. So when you take out that identifying, you're kind of empowering them um, to be like, oh yeah, Kelly is non-binary. Um, and you can ask them what that means to them, but they are non-binary instead of identifying is one of those uh, just like little things and the podcast gender reveal does a really good job into like diving into all of those different like nuancey things that you might not be able to just simply google <laughs> like preference too right what's your gender preference like no it's not my preference it's what my gender is <laughs> yes or what your preferred pronoun it's not preferred it's mandatory <laughs> it's fact it's truth it's what, what is my truth this is my truth that's right. That's right. And we, we do have a couple of questions, you know, asking about identity and book recommendations. And, you know, and the best way to do that is, you know, there are so many different LGBTQ organizations like GLAD, for example, um, the organization GLAD has a, a really good research page. We hear Old Saints Church with a research page and, and that stuff is always building. And also to podcasts. I mean, this has just become one of, I think, the most utilize you know tool out there and what's really neat about podcasts that you know and you just simply just you know that could be a google search you know i'm sure there might be some toxic podcasts but you know you can vet them through as much as you can but uh what's so unique about podcasts is that you actually are hearing folks tell their story and it's a platform for that to be shared and i you know i that's a best way if you are you know if you are an ally and you want to get more acquainted with, you know, identity, that that probably be the best way to do that, um, you know, and, and to actually listen to the stories, you know, obviously get the, get the informative facts, but another best way is to hear the stories um, that folks are, are portraying, you know, portraying their, their truth, their truth and their identity. So um, do that. We have um, a question. Um, let me see, I had it plugged in right here. Um, Okay, so we have a question about, um, so I'll, I'll just read a question here. It says, All Saints really got to me to come out by talking in a way I've never heard before about being myself. What things do you know, uh, do you all do, not only to accept people who, who are out, but to help those struggling and accepting themselves? Oh, yeah, so good. Um, one thing, uh, one thing that I find a lot of people wrestle with is uh, the idea of the commandment to honor your father and mother. And uh, 
they they understand that there's a challenge there between being who they are and then not disrespecting their parent. And they feel that aside from what that does with their relationship with their parent, it makes them feel like a horrible person that they're not respecting their parent, um, that they are obviously, you know, uh, uh, you know, giving up the, the commandment, one of the 10 commandments to, to do this, but, um, it can be a, a real a real point of challenge, and um, I think I've I've done a sermon at the high holidays about this about just letting that go a little bit more because um, there are there are expectations in the Jewish tradition of what parents need to do for their own children as well. There are it's not just that the children are there to serve the parents. Um, there are parental responsibilities, one of which is to teach your child to swim, which I think is really interesting. But uh, that's in the Talmud. But teach them to swim, teach them a trade, find them a partner. Um, but the idea that um, the the families are complicated and that you know, at the end of the day, you have to live the life that's the truth that that's yours. So I think uh, that's, that's a big part of when I see people come to me and they're, they're struggling with who they are. First and foremost is what are my parents going to think? What is my grandparent going to think? I know for myself coming out to my grandma who died this year, may she rest in peace uh, at a hundred years old. Um, you know, I was terrified to come out to her. And so actually I went to my grandfather's grave and I told him through, through the grave. Um, and then I went over to her and I, I came out to her by saying that, you know, I'm in a relationship with a woman and she, and I just like was breaking down with tears. I didn't even know where that was coming from. It was coming from somewhere deep within myself of that self-hatred, that self fear of, you know, what I would do with the family about that, you know, what that would do to the family, what that would do to her and her health and her heart. And, you know, and, and, and I would, I just was at her doorstep. She's like, what's wrong? I'm like, I I'm in love with a girl, with a woman. I'm in love with a woman. And she said, that's great, honey. She like came in, she put her arm around me. She said, I'm so happy for you. You're in such a good relationship. And it was such a relief to me. Um, but not everyone has that experience. I, I know someone who for the past 20 years, she came out 20 years ago, her parents didn't go to her wedding and they're still not accepting of her relationship. And it's now affecting her relationship with her sister and their child. And, um, and her sister lives like a mile away. And you know they have, she has a nephew that she could otherwise be around. So I think that there's there's so much turmoil and that's such a heavy, heavy weight. When we talk about our own personal spirituality, starting with the most intimate, which is family, um, I try to help people just forgive themselves for, you know, being who they are. You know, we've got God making you this way or also even people struggling with, I'm not sure who I am, but I don't even have the space to figure out who I am because I'm getting all of these messages from society, from my parents, from the school, from work, from the government, right? Like, um, so just trying to help people make that space and claim that sacred space around them um, is, is the way that I approach it spiritually. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Rabbi Miller, for that. Kelly, do you want to add? Uh, yeah, I think when folks are struggling to come out and uh, I totally resonate with that parental thing and how scary it is to come out to parents. Um, my parents are like old school, Missouri progressives, NPR listening folks. And um, hello, if they're watching. And <laughs> they're just really um, incredible, wonderful people. And I was so nervous to come out to them, but especially to my gran who also died this year. Uh, may she rest in peace. And uh, it's just so scary um, to the, being afraid to lose that primary relationship, even if you think it's going to be fine. And it's, of course, a lot more scary if you know it's not going to ever be okay. Um, and to get, it's almost like you have to do this like unfair trade of like, I'm going to feel so much freedom when I come out. And even if this doesn't go well, 
with my parents or with my family or with my religious community, the freedom I'm going to feel is going to be so worth it and so incredible. You know, there's stories over and over again about, you know, freedom in the Bible and like what it means to get to the promised land. And if you feel that you're free to be yourself, like, isn't that the most wonderful thing you can do as a child of God is to like be free and to help others get free. That's how I see coming out is a type of freedom you can unlock. So um, while I would never want someone to come out before they're ready, um, I just hope that they know that there's another side to this where they are um, feeling that feeling of flying and freedom and like community and wholeness um, that that's all oh, possible and wonderful and they can do it in their own time. Absolutely. And, and there's so many like online, there's so many communities. I think, you know, absolutely. There, it can be dangerous to come out. And I would, you know, and, and what Kelly, you were saying like that you don't need to come out. If, if you can't come out, don't come out. Like don't come out like the fun message on national coming out day. But if it's a danger to yourself, you need to also forgive yourself for not coming out yet. <laughs> right. This is not like we, Kelly, we sound like we're in a place of privilege that we have this great community around us and we're able to do it. Um, but uh, so forgiving yourself from that. And also there are plenty of, you know, online communities where if you're in a geographic location where it's not safe to come out, but you know, you just want to know about communities that are joined communities virtually there's, you know, I just had someone on my webcast series that's coming out named Serena Poon, who is major, a major force in this like Christian progressive queer community online on Facebook, right? There are communities you can join. Um, and be out online if that's safe for you again right. even if you're not out in your physical world because of where you physically live you can't you can't put a rainbow bumper sticker on your car okay like forgive yourself for that but you know just be who you are in the ways that you can be who you are and um and just know like you said know that there are so many communities out here cheering you on and welcoming you and uh and encouraging you uh, that, that you are who you are and it's sacred. Absolutely. Rabbi Miller, Kelly, Aaron, thank you so much. Uh, this is, gosh, we probably can go for hours on this. We really could. Uh, but thank you. We, we need to do this again. And, you know, and this is such an important, you know, day for folks to understand what it means to come out. You know, I have my story. We all have our stories and how we did that. And, and they're, and they're all, you know, on this band of, of, from safety to not being able to do it. And yet, you know, it takes years for folks and for some folks to do it. So, uh, but this is a place to start. And um, just thank you so much for your insight and your wisdom on that.